Okay, any, uh, <clears throat> any last questions uh, about the, the schedule going forward? Anybody want to talk about uh, exam schedule and stuff like that? Is the exam next Monday or next Wednesday? Uh, we are slotted into uh, Monday or Wednesday at one o'clock. Sorry, one Wednesday one o'clock to two fifty. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Does that mean that we will have both Wednesday and Monday to review? Uh, Wednesday is the last class because Monday starts finals week. No, no I, what I meant was, um, so if the finals on Wednesday, does that mean we have this Wednesday and next Monday to review? We will not have next Monday because next Monday is the final exam schedule. So, so the exam is on Monday or Wednesday, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we, you and I and everybody else will not have a review schedule on Monday because that's actually finals week. Oh, okay, I see. So our last class together is Wednesday. All right. Uh, and uh, the last class of the semester is Thursday for your Thursday classes. So <clears throat> what that means is we'll have the review session on Wednesday of this week, and then you'll have another week until the exam. All right. Okay, any other questions? Yep. Is the final going to be set up like the midterm? Same way. Um, in the midterm, you gave us a list of questions and you did the the draw of what numbers and then we pick, you know, or is it going to be all 10 questions? Uh, no, same thing. Uh, you have the questions already, right? Because I sent them out and they're posted on Blackboard. Um, so on uh, Wednesday uh, of next week, uh, the 12th, I will uh, draw four questions and that'll be your final. So you, you have twice as many questions to draw from and twice as many questions you have to answer and the final exam counts twice as much. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? <clears throat> okay, let's get rolling. Uh, so last two articles in this, uh, in this collected uh, series of essays uh, chapter 13, J.H. Eliot's Atlantic History. Uh, so these two, uh, are, these two essays, the one from Eliot and the one from Benton, <coughs> are dealing with the same topic, but they come at it from different perspectives, right? Um, one represents one approach to viewing Atlantic world history uh, and how it developed, uh, and another represents a different approach to Atlantic world history uh, and uh, how they view it, all right? So let's start with Eliot first because that's uh, the first one in our essays. Um, so how does Eliot view Atlantic world history? Uh, how, does it, how does it develop according to Eliot? Anyone? Is it one Atlantic world history according to Eliot? Doesn't she talk about the Indian Ocean? Uh, that was Benton's approach, <clears throat> and we'll talk about we'll talk about Benton second. Uh, so you're correct uh, that Indian Ocean is part of the discussion, but it's in the second essay, All right? Uh, Cynthia. How, how does Eliot view this process of uh, Atlantic world history developing? He has two approaches, like talks about connections and comparisons. Okay, how, how does this process, how does he view this process coming together? I'm not quite sure what you mean. Um, does he look at Atlantic world history and say, aha, this is how uh, it is. It's one Atlantic world history. And um, that's how um, it's always been discussed. And that's how we should continue discussing it, comma. Or 
does he view it as there was a previous process of examining world history that grew up into this system? Anyone help Cynthia out? Danny, you want to help Cynthia out? Yeah, I'm not sure either. Tatiana? Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. <laughs> um, I feel like it was the second one where like there was originally a different uh, system and it grew into this new system. Okay. If I remember my reading right. Um, but, System as in plurals, right? So systems, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. um, here's what Elliot's talking about. So we're talking about and have been talking about this Atlantic world system, right? We've been talking about the British Atlantic world, but we've been talking about the British Atlantic world as these essays do, uh, kind of writ large. <clears throat> so the British Atlantic world, you know, we talked about religion. We were to talk about religion in British North America, we also had to talk about the Spanish experience and the French experience, right? So last week we talked about religion, and in order to talk about this British system, we had to be able to compare and contrast to other entities in this Atlantic world system. Um, we talked about previously about Klein's book on the Atlantic slave trade, and the Atlantic slave trade is not just trade to Virginia in 1619, right? That's actually a very small part of the Atlantic slave trade. For Klein, it's a discussion of the entire system in the Atlantic world, right? Uh, a system uh, that grows out of the plantation system from the Mediterranean, it's transferred to the, to the uh, new world. And he, we talked about the Atlantic slave trade from Brazil all the way up to uh, Virginia, right? So this is a larger Atlantic world system. This idea of seeing the Atlantic world as a system, as something that can be examined um, for Melissa, this is ex extra uh, credit work for you, Melissa, uh, as my uh, lone historian. Uh, oh, and now you too, Tatiana, as my uh, budding new historian. <clears throat> this process grows out of, uh, or is analogous, Elliot says, to something that Ferdinand Braudel discussed the Mediterranean, right? And so I'm going to make an analogy that Eliot's drawing upon um, from the business of history. You can talk about the Mediterranean uh, uh, Sea, right, and talk about just the Mediterranean. And then you can talk about the things that border the Mediterranean and call that the Mediterranean world, right? So the Mediterranean world is the, the water uh, and then the places that bound it. That's one way of viewing the Mediterranean. But what Braudel did was he said, actually, you can follow things that are linked to the Mediterranean and still say they're part of the Mediterranean world, right? Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, well, I'll give you an example in terms of uh, a commodity, right? Um, it became fashionable to wear silk uh, in the Mediterranean, right? During the Roman Empire, silk was an item that was in great demand. So you could talk about the silk trading system as part of the Mediterranean world. But we know that silk comes from China, right? It's the only place that it came from uh, was China. So to talk about silks in the Mediterranean world, we can say that that silk system or the exchange of that product of silk is also part of the Mediterranean world, right? Uh, you can talk about it in terms of the extension of the Mediterranean world into religion, for example. And Mariana Buddhism uh, in China uh, and Southeast Asia, there is part of the process was you make these pilgrimages. And at these pilgrimages at different monasteries uh, on, this, um, on this site, you would make ritual offerings. Well, one of those ritual offerings that you made in China um, to, uh, um, you know, as part of your Buddhist uh, tour and pilgrimage, one of the items you offered was a type of coral that only grows in the Mediterranean, right? So 
if you view the Mediterranean expansively, this idea not only of the sea and the things it bounces up against the, you know, the shoreline, but link it to how the Mediterranean influences things around it and how things around it influence, influence the Mediterranean, then you can view this as a larger world structure, right? So the Mediterranean doesn't end when you uh, hit the land. It is something that extends further. Well, you can see the obvious analogies to where we uh, began this book, talking about the three ways of seeing the Atlantic world, right? Um, that Armitage laid out, right? So this vision of the Mediterranean world is consciously and unconsciously. This was developed um, by Braudel in the mid um, 1900s, right? Uh, actually during World War II, he, he was working on this project of conceptualizing the Mediterranean as a historical entity beyond just, you know, you're in Italy or you're in Egypt or, you know, you're on the Iberian Peninsula, right? Beyond just that extension, but thinking about how the Mediterranean influences and is influenced by things on the larger scales as you kind of radiate out from the geographic location of the Mediterranean. Well, that's what the Atlantic world system is as well, right? So thinking about Klein, we're talking about, you know, the Atlantic slave trade, not just slave trade to what becomes the United States, but this whole uh, idea of slavery, right? <clears throat> so what Eliot says, this too um, has sort of an intellectual history uh, for viewing the Atlantic history, right? He says it doesn't spring fully formed. He says, instead, there's actually three Atlantics. And the experience of these three Atlantic world system eventually began to intermesh and overlap and become one large Atlantic world structure, right? So first is the North Atlantic, which he says, Elliot says, centers around the Newfoundland fisheries, right? These fisheries uh, and the people who fished in them were linked to the old world and represented a circuit, right? So there's a circuit of the North Atlantic. He says there's a second Atlantic circuit, which is the Spanish Atlantic, right? Which would be uh, the Caribbean and Mesoamerica, the places that the Spanish empire established. So we think about their circuit, right? To get uh, from Spain, you had to sail south and then head out west. And then to return to Spain, you actually had to sail up north uh, uh, to catch the currents to then turn east and return uh, to Spain. So this is a big circuit. What do you think the third circuit is? So now we've talked about two of them. What do you think the third one is, Abby? I'm not sure. Well, let's think who else is in this Atlantic world. So we've <laughs> talked about the British and the French in the North system, right? Newfoundland, which is um, part, which is was then part of New France and then becomes part of the British Atlantic Empire. But it's a system in which British uh, and French, as well as others, the, some of the first people to uh, fish off the Newfoundland fisheries uh, were uh, from Spain, right? Uh, uh, so um, this sort of circuit is the Northern circuit. And then we talked about the Spanish circuit, which is the Caribbean and Mesoamerica, right? And how that big circuit is linked together to get uh, from Spain to extract wealth and return to Spain. It's a big circuit, right? What's the third circuit, do you think? Well, um, so Portugal, despite being right next to Spain, it, they have a different area of South America. Where would that be? Uh, Brazil. Okay, it's called, he calls it the Lusso Atlantic, right? Uh, this is the Portuguese system, which links Portugal, Africa, and Brazil into a big circuit. Eliot argues up through the 17th century, these were three distinct circuits. You had a Northern circuit, which was British, French, uh, and back to Europe. 
you had the Spanish circuit, which was the Caribbean and Mesoamerica and back to Spain. And then you had the Lusso Atlantic circuit, which is Portugal, Africa, and Brazil, right? These three circuits operating largely independently eventually begin to merge. And he says, that's what creates this Atlantic world structure. Smaller examples grow up into bigger examples, right? That begin to be interlinked so that the British aren't just sailing to the Newfoundland fisheries. The, Br the British begin to muscle in to the Caribbean uh, and they also begin to control portions of the uh, slave trade from Africa, right? So over the course of time, these three circuits begin to merge into one world system. So when we're talking about what Klein is talking about, the Atlantic slave trade, it starts out as sort of, you know, kingdom oriented, let's say. So the Portuguese empire, right, is controlling the delivery of slaves to their overseas colony in Brazil. But they cannot control just um, their, uh, their involvement in the Atlantic slave trade. Instead, other kingdoms and other entities begin to muscle in, right? So they become part of a larger Atlantic world system, one that, as Eliot sees it, was three distinct ones that merged over time to create one Atlantic world system, right? Uh, and this is, a, this is a system or an approach, an Atlantic history approach. He calls it national, but it's national in quotes because we're predating nation states, right? Um, the origin of the nation state is really kind of uh, uh, pegged with the French Revolution, right? Uh, but we don't have to get bound up with that. Um, but this idea of distinct kingdoms or nations as uh, to, for simplicity's sake, as part of having an independent system that merges until they're all into one system, right? He says, this type of Atlantic history is best told through connections and comparisons. So thinking again, back to the original essay that uh, Armitage penned to provide the sort of uh, theoretical framework, we're talking about <clears throat> the type of comparisons, right? So the Spanish slave trade compared to the British slave trade, right? There's a lot of similarities, but there are also some differences, right? So within this larger world structure, we can talk about how these nations uh, are working within this structure. And it's in some ways, it's very comparable, but sometimes it's different, right? Um, so this is a process that evolves over time. And so to illustrate that, he gives it, uh, what uh, historians call a counterfactual example, right? What is a counterfactual? Is it like an opinion that counters what the facts say? Kind of like a hypothesis, kind of, sort of? Not exactly like that. Hmm. Is it similar to like a counter argument? So basically like his opinion or his researched thought um, and how it's different from someone else's. That's more revisionist. Okay. Not counterfactual, right? So let's take the word apart. So uh, Stephanie, what's, what's a fact? Mm, something that's proven to be true. Okay. So in this approach, right, we know that uh, Christopher Columbus sailed for Spain and discovered the new world. That's a fact, right? Um, yes. So is, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Isn't it um, like where it's, it's like an alternative? Um, If, if things were, if the circumstances were just a bit different, what it would have been like? Good. It's not, it, it's not um, the fact that happened. It's if something had been slightly changed, what would have occurred following that, right? So a good counterfactual makes a subtle change and then sees what the responses would be. So for Elliot, right? So 
um, as Stephanie, Stephanie and I have confirmed, right? Uh, Christopher Columbus sailed for Spain, right? But what if Christopher Columbus, who had offers, offered his services to the English crown, what if his services had been accepted by the English crown and then he sailed for England and discovered the new world, right? So here we have a factual event. The new world was discovered by Christopher Columbus. The fact was that he was sailing for Spain. And so Spain discovered the new world and Spain set off on a particular trajectory, right? That is what history happened. But a, a counterfactual can be a useful way of bringing in the high relief um, things that are uh, uh, beyond just the individuals involved. So his counterfactual is, what would have happened if he was sailing for England instead of Spain, right? He would have discovered the new world sailing for the English crown. And instead of Spain setting up colonies and extracting wealth from the new world, it would have been England that extracted wealth from the new world. Instead of Spain become the dominant, becoming the dominant power in Europe, fueled by this torrent of gold and silver they extracted from the land, it would have been the English, right? And so by examining what he proposes would have happened from that slight change, we see a different trajectory <coughs> for, the, for the English empire. It would have been, Elliot argues, more like Spain. Now, what makes this more than just, you know, uh, a, a game that historians do after having a few whiskeys is that it's useful to illustrate how the processes and the uh, environment that things occur in has historical influence. And so by following through his counterfactual, he argues that the structure of the Atlantic world would have resulted in a similar type of thing. You would have had a powerful European state enriched uh, by uh, the gold and silver, right? Uh, for the relationship with Native American peoples, uh, they would have inadvertently served as the deliverer of pestilence, just as the Spanish initially were, right? They would have had dramatic impact in the new world because they linked the new world to the old, right? So it wasn't a function of Spanish depravity that led to the steep population crashes, crashes in the new world. We've seen that Crosby argues it's a biological process. Well, that biological process would have had an English name as opposed to a Spanish name. But then he says, there's other things that go along with it the growth and power of the English empire would have evoked uh, jealousy and uh, alliances by the other states against the English, the same way they lined up against the Spanish, right? And so by plucking out Spain and inserting England, there are processes that would have unfolded that would have been very similar, but there would have been probably some differences that Eliot plays out as well. We wouldn't have had, um, he suggests, we wouldn't have had this break with England and the Pope um, that uh, the torrent of gold and silver uh, flowing into England would have allowed Henry VIII to reach uh, a much uh, uh, easier accommodation with the Pope regarding his potential divorce. And so there would have been no schism that led to the creation of the Anglican Church as opposed to um, you know, the Catholic Church continuing to dominate England. Right? So a good counterfactual makes slight changes and keeps things probable and possible to help highlight the larger issues involved as opposed to just the personality, right? That's what he does. Um, I have to tell you, this will probably confuse you, uh, but uh, one of the things that always uh, stuck in my mind about counterfactuals uh, in the old Saturday Night Live, so back in the 70s, there was one uh, where the counterfactual was, uh, what if Spartacus had a Piper Cub? Uh, and so 
uh, it's a ridiculous counterfactual because why would uh, Spartacus be flying around in a single uh, seat uh, or a single engine uh, small aircraft? And what would he do with it is ridiculous, but it's a type of counterfactual, but you know, it always stands out in my mind as a ri the ridiculous end of the spectrum, right? Whereas what Elliot's arguing here is a slight change can help highlight the sort of systemic issues that are involved as opposed to something else, right? Uh, and so um, this is, uh, he argues, would have had much greater significance later. So his approach, Eliot's approach, is that the Atlantic world is something that grew up into a larger structure uh, from three separate Atlantic systems that over time became combined into one. And it's the structure of these systems of this larger Atlantic world that helps, that helps us understand how things, events play out. All right, okay. Any other Elliot questions, comments, concerns? All right, so now on to Benton. Um, Tatiana, were you talking about Benton? What is, what is her argument? What was that you cut out on me? Uh, were you talking about Benton? What is her argument about? How does she view the Atlantic world? I don't believe I mentioned her, but I can talk about her if you'd like All me right, to. Let's talk about her then. Okay, here, let me grab my book real quick. <laughs> Oh, let me get to the right page. Let's find my notes. Well, while so you're searching, she... while you're searching oh. for the right page here, let me give you a little background on uh, Benton, right? So Benton is a world historian. Uh, and uh, she ha had some earlier work uh, that was done on comparative law. And so she was looking at law within the larger British system, right? And making some comparisons about the rule of law in different places and seeing uh, uh, areas of uh, harmony, but also areas of different approaches, right? And so uh, as a world historian, uh, her background is in law within uh, this larger world system. All right, go ahead, Tatiana. Um, so she, wasn't she talking about like, like these hidden like connections mm -hmm. that were, Good. I'm trying to remember exactly what I was right, or what I was saying in this, but like she was looking at like British, Asian and the Atlantic okay, good. engagements. Right, good. Uh, who said the Indian Ocean system before? Who was that? I did. Ah, good, Melissa. All right. So uh, what was um, what was Benton, what were, you, what were you drawing upon from Benton to talk about the Indian Ocean? What are you talking about? Well, I was thinking that um, it wasn't just the, the Atlantic Ocean, the cross from the Atlantic Ocean. Uh -huh. With the trading, it also included the Indian and the Pacific Oceans. Okay, good. All right. So um, the key here is thinking about the structure of the British Empire, right? So we talked about, um, well, let me draw upon this. So we talked about um, the Navigation Acts, which set up this um, uh, economic structure which is akin to capitalism, but isn't capitalism. What did we call that before? Mercantilism. Okay. And in mercantilism, what are some of the actors in play? Um, like the Caribbean um, sugar plantations. Okay. That's part of it. What else? Britain. Okay. What part of Britain? Are we talking the Scottish Highlands? And then the uh, London. Okay. And what are, what's the formal term for that? Do you remember what that is? Um, London is the, the metropole. Oh, okay. The center, right? 
London is the center of the British Empire because that's the capital. So the Caribbean is what? What is the Caribbean for the metropole? It's a supplier for raw materials. Okay, what is another term we call that? Well, if you wanna be specific, it would be the hinterland, but since we're talking about a colonial structure, what is it? A colony? It's a colony, right? So this mercantile system is designed to benefit the mother country, the metropole, in which the colonies serve as an extension of the mother country, the suppliers of raw materials. And what else do they do, Marshall? Uh, they buy the refined products from okay. the metropole. So the relationship between the two is that the colonies are subordinate to the mother country, right? Okay. So we've talked quite a bit about this British Atlantic world. And we talked about the Navigation Acts who are creating this structure of uh, benefiting the mother country, which creates this economic system known as mercantilism, different than capitalism, although related, right? Similar, some similar ideas. So uh, Melissa, now let's go back to what you're telling me, right? So we're talking about the sugar islands here, correct? What else does Benton talk about? Um, not too sure. Well, we're talking about the uh, Caribbean, which is part of the Atlantic Ocean. What was the other part you were talking about? Mm, the Indian and the Pacific Oceans, the, uh, that side. Right. So Benton argues that thinking about the Atlantic world, you know, it has its uh, value, but you're missing the point because the metropole doesn't see the Atlantic world as something separate. She says the Atlantic world is part of a larger world for the British. And so instead of saying, we're gonna talk about events in the Atlantic world, and then you have another set of historians who talk about events in the uh, Indian Ocean world, right? Uh, and they're disconnected. She says, we're, you're actually imposing um, an artificial distinction that they would not understand, right? Or would not agree to. This is a system in which the metropole utilizes its colonies and overseas locations to benefit itself. And so they don't see the Atlantic as one system and the Indian Ocean as a separate system. They see them all as feeding and supporting the metropole. So they see it as one world system, right? And so she says, you can't really view this with these artificial uh, impositions between the two sections because they see it <coughs> as one. And then she gives some examples, right? So Sir Walter Raleigh, um, who is famous in Atlantic world history, well, his world isn't just dealing with the colony in Virginia and, uh, and then his role in uh, the section of North Carolina. He's part of this British Atlantic or British world, not Atlantic world, this British world system. And so if we're doing the, his biography, we'd have a section of time where he's in the Atlantic world, but then he's also involved in the British experience in the Indian Ocean world. And he wouldn't see it as I've crossed over to a new world system. He would see it as still operating within this British world. And so the Atlantic world is an artificial imposition uh, of what they would not understand. They see this as the colonies, whether the colonies are in the Atlantic Ocean or they're trying to establish colony, col colonies in the Indian Ocean to them, their task is to serve and enrich and benefit the metropole, the mother country. So for the people, the characters that we identify with Atlantic world history, many of them also have stories in the Indian Ocean or involved in some other aspect 
of the British Empire or world, because for them, that's the world they inhabit, not you know the Atlantic world that we impose on them. And she says, you should see this as something that is global from the outset, right? Not something that grew up to be global. She says, from the very beginning, the ambitions were to be global, and that's how they acted. And so instead of seeing, you know, this system grew up and then they became this, you need to say this was envisioned as a global system that maybe took off in various locations at different times, but they were not unconnected. The connections of individual and trade were always there. And so she says, we should view the British Atlantic history in two phases. There's the early 16th century to 1690 time frame, and then there's from 1690 to the end of the 18th century, right? She said, you know, this is the traditional story is that uh, England goes to the East, right? Well, everybody wants to get into this global trade with the East because it's, it's the most lucrative, right? This is where wealth and power is. It's in the Indian Ocean, it's in the Chinese Sea, it's in the products that uh, these folks want to mu muscle in on. <clears throat> what happens over time is that the Atlantic colonies begin to become more profitable, but it takes time. The effort, the drive was to be a global trading power, not a, an ocean trading power, right? Uh, and so, Thinking about this, right? So there's no better embodiment than um, what what is the um, what is the proper British mid afternoon beverage? Tea. Tea. And where does tea come from? Isn't it over in like India? Yes, India and China are where the tea plantations are, right? Um, uh, there's, there's a type of tea known as Ceylon tea, right? That tells you where it comes from. Tea comes from the Asian system, right? And when you serve tea, what do you serve with it? Sugar. Sugar. And where does sugar come from? The Atlantic system. Precisely. It's the perfect embodiment of, uh, in one cup of the British Empire, right? They don't see, oh, we got this whole tea business going on and we have the whole sugar business going on. They both serve the empire. And so we're gonna have a cup of tea with a little bit of sugar, right? So that is uh, the luxury trade and the status symbols that go with it. Sugar is a status symbol because sugar is initially expensive. And so your willingness, uh, you know, phrases that you, you hear and maybe not think much about in the past, right? One lump or two to offer somebody for the, to sweeten their hot tea, um, that's really kind of an extravagance. You know, we, sugar now is so uh, um, cheap that we put bowls of it on um, tables or in packets when you go in the restaurants and you can pour 80 packets into your iced tea if you're of the mind, right? Well, that was a luxury item that was very expensive. So it was part of your demonstration of your wealth and power that you could say, oh, would you like one lump or two with your tea, right? Not only are you offering it, you're offering an overabundance, right? That's part of this luxury trade and it's a sign of how the empire works. The empire is not separating tea and sugar, right? For them, they're all just part of this extension of British imperial power and might. Both the Atlantic and Indian Ocean systems <coughs> have the same, they face the same questions. Initially, the answers are the same, but over time, there's a divergence, right? Uh, in the Indian Ocean system, there is a development of a different legal structure, right? Uh, the East India Company develops in the Indian Ocean system, and it's a different relationship than the colonies of the Atlantic, 
right? Especially those quarrelsome 13 colonies in North America. Initially, they're treated as part of the same system. That's why she pegs that change to 1690. Uh, because after the glorious revolution, when you have the reinstallment of parliament, then you begin to see a divergence in how uh, parliament deals with these two colonial entities, the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic world, right? So in the Indian Ocean, the uh, East India Company is formed to represent British interests. And it is a quasi-state entity. What does a quasi-state mean? Partial state. OK. It's partially a state and partially private. It represents British interests in the Indian Ocean, right? But it's a private company. It's the East India Company, but it's not really private, right? Because the major stockholders are royal uh, members as well as senior members of the parliament. So it's partially a private company that's involved in generating a profits, but almost all its stock is owned by government officials. So it operates as an extension of the state, but only partly. So this is not, so the, the British, regular British army does not occupy parts of India. The East India Company has a militia army that they raise and pay for, but the stockholders are all the uh, uh, British um, uh, aristocrats and government officials. I want you to hold on to that concept because when I talk about uh, you know, the setup for the film, we're going to draw upon this notion of the East India Company, right, uh, and what it does. In the Atlantic world, um, these colonies have their own charters. They're granted a charter to establish a colony. Now, thinking back to when we were talking about Jamestown, Jamestown was uh, a private venture, you know, with the support of the crown, but these were private investors who were hoping to get rich. They wanted to find gold and silver just like the Spanish. And because these people's experience was colonizing Ireland, they took that experience of colonization to the new world and established colonies in which they had a charter from the crown to establish it. So thinking about the colony of Pennsylvania, uh, Penn's father, William Penn's father, was owed money by the British crown. So instead of paying him out in uh, shillings or gold or something, they said, hey, how about we give you a big whack of land in North America where you can establish your own colony, right? Uh, a colony where you can bring your Quaker friends, right? So that is an independent entity given to William Penn's father, who gave it to his son, who to establish a colony that ended up being called Pennsylvania, Penn's Woods, right? So that is a, a, an entity, there's a charter from the crown, but it's not the crown that's colonizing it, right? Um, in the Massachusetts Bay, right, with a Massachusetts Bay colony, um, the king wanted the, the parliament wanted the charter back and they wouldn't give it to him. They said, no, we're not giving the charter back. We're chartered to be an independent colony. And so in the Atlantic world, these independent colonies, um, sometimes formally, like the Massachusetts Bay Colony or Pennsylvania, sometimes started off as an independent colony, but reverted to the crown colony because they went bankrupt like Virginia, right? Those colonies grew up without the same level of oversight. Those charters were not extended in the Indian Ocean system. In that system, the East India Company uh, represents British state interests and, and also as private interests. And so over time, the relationship to the colonies to the mother country increasingly diverged. This is where we're drawing, uh, Laurie Bennett's drawing upon her uh, examination of legal uh, uh, issues, right? These colonies diverged and continued to progress in their own fashion. After 
what we call the French and Indian War here in the United States, but over in Europe, they call it the Seven Years War. After the Seven Years War, the uh, British sought to reassert control over their colonies, right? Part of the reason they sought to reassert control is because they had amassed a huge debt, right? This was for the British and the French, this was a global war because it was fought all over the globe, not just in North America. For the North American colonists, it was fought just in North America as far as they knew, right? Or as far as they cared. Um, but for the metropoles of Britain and uh, France or um, for London and Paris, this was part of a global contest, right? Um, the French gave up New France as a result of it, right? And so coming out of this conflict in six, 1763, the British sought to reassert a tighter control over these colonial uh, outposts. In the Indian Ocean system, the uh, uh, East India Company acting at the behest of the crown tightened up its control, right? Those um, uh, subjects of the British Empire in the Indian Ocean system weren't the same type of colonists who had their own charters. In uh, the North American colonies, this effort was stoutly resisted because over time, these colonies in North America had grown increasingly independent. And so when the Crown sought to reestablish authority, it was met with great resistance. So for Benton, the way she says to see this British Atlantic world is not to see it as a separate entity that grew up into a bigger thing as Eliot sees it. She says, but from the outset to always see it as part of a global system because that's how they viewed it and that's how they intended it. And so to understand the British Atlantic world experience, you have to slot it in to this larger global system that the British were aspiring to build and did build. And to see that uh, in that fashion. And she said, no, not to say they're exactly the same, that's the point in talking about how they diverged and why the crackdown for the British in the Indian Ocean allowed them to retain their colonies but the crackdown in North America failed. It led to rebellion in which those rebellious colonies were able to escape British colonial control. They didn't lose everything in the British Atlantic world, right? Um, Bermuda um, still, uh, uh, still carries the distinctive Britishness uh, of uh, its formation, right? Um, the British still have some minor um, uh, uh, control over uh, places in the Caribbean, right? Uh, Canada still has the queen on their currency, right? So uh, those type of things uh, say that the British Atlantic world didn't wink out, right? But they lost that big chunk known as the North American colonies because they weren't able to bring them back together. All right, any questions about Benton? So you think you can compare and contrast Elliot to Benton successfully if such a question were to appear on the final? I think so. Okay. Okay. Well, this leads us to the last bit, um, which is related to <coughs> the run-up to the American Revolution. Right. And so uh, some of the background material. Right. And then I'll give you a specific example. Um, so um, the film that is linked up there is part of a, a larger series uh, that is kind of modeled on the approach um, uh, that was used, that is still used um, by um, uh, the folks who produced the historian or the historical documentaries for like the Civil War. Um, uh, history of baseball, the Ken Burns style, right, in which you take uh, historical events, 
uh, and historical dialogue and you uh, link them together with images and such, right? So the, the uh, video that uh, is linked up there or the, or the uh, information is linked up there is part of a series. And the one that we watch is called The Reluctant Revolutionaries. And it's talking specifically about the colonial experience after 1763 that leads to the first shots fired in the American Revolution. So how do we get from 1763 to um, uh, Bunker Hill uh, or um, uh, Lexington and Cambridge in 1775, right? It is a comparatively short period of time, 12 years, that um, the argument of the film is that those 12 years are what led to the revolution that results in the creation of the United States. It's this uh, event that appeared um, impossible in 1763, that these colonies would want to leave the empire uh, to um, 1775, where for many of them, um, not all of them by any stretch, but for many of the colonists, it became inevitable that they had to leave, right? And so examining that process, so thinking about the way that Benton sets it up to say, this is directly resulting or a direct result because of the British attempt to reassert a level of control over these colonies that they had never exerted before, right? These colonies had grown up uh, independent over time, even though they considered themselves British, right? That's the, the remarkable thing about it. And so uh, I, you know, I encourage you because you have access here at the university, take a look at colonial newspapers and see what they talk about in the period prior to the American Revolution. What they talk about, it's what's going on in London because for them, that's what's most important, right? And so uh, what ships are coming in? What are the debates in parliament? You know, how do our markets look over there? Because of this, the success of this system of mercantilism, they are directed back to the metropole. That's where their focus is. That's what they're interested in, right? And so these folks were very content being part of this British empire. Now to shift the, the gaze uh, of these events to the British side, right? They have just emerged from an enormously expensive uh, conflict, this uh, global seven years war. And it's part of a larger conflict of uh, a, an ambitious British empire, which is seeking to continue to expand, right? And this stuff is expensive. And so they see the expenditures that they have uh, uh, used as something that has benefited the North American colonies greatly. And this debt that has, uh, has been amassed by these British uh, efforts uh, at uh, expanding and protecting their uh, uh, empire are something that they feel everybody should bear the burden of, especially those people who are doing very well. And one of the experiences of the Seven Years' War is that lots of British soldiers and the British officer class came to the North American continent to prosecute the war against the French and their Native American allies. Uh, the British also had Native American allies. It was kind of a Native American civil war, right? In tramping all across these co colonies, engaging in conflict, they experienced directly the, the wealth that was found in these North American colonies. Uh, these North American colonists, many of them were very prosperous, uh, and uh, even the common people had pretty substantial plots of land, right? And so for British eyes, they see these North American colonies have done very well under the protective wing of the British Empire, and they ought to pay a little bit more for that protection, right? That's not how the colonists see it. The colonists see that they too 
uh, uh, expended blood and treasure in this conflict already because British colonists in the Americas served in the militia fighting alongside British uh, regular army units. Uh, and these colonists say they have been involved in taxing uh, themselves to run government on behalf of the British uh, parliament in the new world, right? And so they see this system as, you know, we've been, we've been funding ourselves for quite a while. Uh, and so uh, we should continue to fund that, right? So thinking again back to some of our previous discussions um, about the notion of uh, uh, rule of law and civility, right? that social order is a reflection of the people who are the right sorts to rule. Well, for the, these folks who come over from uh, Britain and have tramped all over this, the colonies are a collection of folks who are not fit to rule. <laughs> they are <clears throat> not the right sorts. Uh, their attempts to um, ape the proper behavior uh, is woefully inadequate, and so they view them as provincials. Uh, they didn't have a high regard uh, for the militia because they said, you know, they, they don't hold their ranks very well. They appear and disappear when they see fit, uh, and they're not a regular fighting force that one can rely upon. So their disdain of the militia forces and this sort of superior notion uh, that these damn colonists, these damn provincials should be thankful for what we've done is what is sort of in the background. They're not fit to rule, right? The proper sorts to fit to rule are already in parliament, right? Uh, if you want to spit out a few folks who think may um, measure up to the lowest standards of a ruling class in parliament, then you can send them across but they're not interested in ceding that sort of responsibility to the colonies. That's the background. So now, um, uh, Edith, what is the primary purpose behind the Navigation Acts? Why are they uh, constructed? The primary, there's a secondary that is part of it, but, but the primary purpose of the Navigation Acts, what were they designed to do? What was it about? Um, it was a... Do you remember what the Navigation Acts, what some of them are? Yes, I think... I... Okay. Well, let's think about it. So tell me, tell me what one of the Navigation Acts is about. One was that they only could were only some ships would be able to bring goods into England. Okay, good. What right? kind of ships were they? English? British ships, right? English ships. Okay, right? Uh -huh. So trade from the colonies has to be carried in uh, British ships, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, what are these trade items? What are the ones certain enumerated trade items have to do what? They have to go to the mother country to be processed. Okay. Uh, things like what? Sugar. Okay. Uh, tobacco and a few other things. The most valuable elements of trade, right? What is What are these navigation acts doing? What do they deal with? What is their purpose? The point is, What's that? It's, it's to enrich them a uh, the mother country? Yes, it's to enrich the mother country. How do these navigation acts do that? With mercantilism. Right. And what are they doing? So we're talking about trade. It, what are they doing with trade? They're making sure trade has to go through them. They're directing trade, right? That's what the navigation acts are primarily about. It's about directing trade so that it goes through British hands to benefit the mother country, right? Uh, and they're written exclusively, uh, or they're written to develop an exclusivity for certain items.
to benefit the mother country, right? But it's mainly about directing the trade to generate wealth, right? If we uh, make, make it a rule, a law, that goods have to be carried in English ships, well, that's going to benefit the English shipbuilding industry, which is going to generate more wealth, which can then be plowed back into building new British ships and new British war ships to protect them, right? So directing the trade benefits the mother country. Shipping certain items directly to the metropole uh, by law means that those items that generate wealth will pass through British hands, right? Uh, in capitalism, um, foster uh, plantation owner uh, in the Caribbean producing sugar could sell it to the highest bidder, right? Which would make foster the plantation owner rich, right? But that's not going to benefit the mother country. If Foster can sell his or has to sell his products so they are delivered to London as opposed to Amsterdam, well, then London is going to be able to resell that and become rich as well. So Foster is going to get rich either way. He'd get richer in a capitalist system by selling it to the highest bidder, right? Uh, but he has to sell it to the mother country because it's designed to benefit the mother country. And it does so by directing trade. Now, that's not only what it does, right? Uh, they, uh, the, the navigation acts that say goods from other European kingdoms or states have to go through English ports, they do that because they put a tax on them. And that's about raising revenue. But by and large, the British Empire has not directly taxed the colonies for revenue. They have directed their trade, enforced the direction of this trade to generate wealth and power for the metropole, right? But they haven't squeezed the subjects directly to extract money from them, right? After 1763, Parliament says, we got a big debt, we got to squeeze these folks, right? And so figuring out a way to squeeze money out of the colonists that are going to go directly to Parliament to use to pay down the debt that they have incurred in prosecuting this war, that's what Parliament's trying to do. It's largely a break with what's going on. It's not exclusive, right? And I'll give you an example. Uh, it's called the Sugar Act. And as the, sh the, the um, Sugar Act said that uh, sugar must go directly to the mother country, which is true. Uh, but sort of a loophole was the creation of um, molasses. And molasses could be sold elsewhere. And molasses was sold to Boston, making Boston the number two rum producer in the world, right, at that time. Um, that is sort of a loophole. Well, even with all the molasses that they were uh, Bostonians were getting from English colonies uh, in producing sugar, uh, it wasn't they. It wasn't sufficient, so they would import molasses from sh French sugar islands like Haiti uh, or Dutch uh, uh, sugar islands, right? Or anywhere they could get molasses. <coughs> Technically, they're supposed to pay uh, a tax on that molasses imported from other states. Um, but the, the, and that had been in place since the early 1700s, pay a tax on this molasses imported from other places uh, used to produce sugar. Well, what had occurred is that the, the law wasn't really enforced. It was mainly uh, a, a standard bribe that was uh, given um, for customs officials to look elsewhere, right? And so even though that law was on the books, it really wasn't enforced by parliament. They weren't getting any money from this system. There was a standard bribe of uh, people in the colonies bribing customs officials who pocketed the money. So parliament wasn't getting any of this money. So after 1763, parliament begins to try and figure out how they can extract money from the colonies, right? Taxing them directly. Uh, to generate revenue, something they largely had not pursued uh, in any um, uh, sustained way previously. So there's a law in the books uh, about the Sugar Act, right? But it's been ignored for decades, right? Uh, and so Parliament's not getting any money out of it. We talked before 
about trying to force the colonies to use stamped paper. And we use that, uh, the Stamp Act is a perfect embodiment of uh, British thinking, right? If we get the leading elements in town to do this, uh, the better sorts in town, then the common folks will follow their leader like uh, baby ducklings behind mother duck, right? Because that's who sets the pace, the better people uh, and all the uh, common sorts follow them, right? Uh, gentlemen are the ones who, who lead uh, in this British mindset. So when the British try to hit upon ways of extracting uh, money directly, they're met with great resistance by the colonists because the, because the colonists say, uh, we don't pay taxes to parliament. We pay taxes to our local uh, government who are the crown officials, but we fund them so you don't have to. So you're talking about, we owe you money for what happened uh, in the, you know, the French and Indian War, all this debt. Well, we, our militia were fighting side by side. We bore our burden, they see it. And so you're trying to change the rules of the game, they say to parliament, by shifting this to direct taxation on the people to generate money for parliament. That uh, lends itself to what becomes one of the rallying cries, no taxation without representation. Right? These worlds come together, the Atlantic world and uh, the Indian Ocean world, in a perfect example uh, of this, uh, what, how the British are trying to come up with ways to extract wealth. In this case, the East India Company uh, is in financial trouble. And again, remember that the East India Company, a quasi-government company, it, uh, it, it represents the interests of the British crown in the Indian Ocean system, but its stockholders are many members of parliament and many members of the uh, aristocratic class, right? So it's ostensibly a private entity, but a lot of government officials own the shares. And so it's in trouble. And so parliament comes up with what they see as a perfect plan. They say the East India Company, um, one of its major products is it, uh, it uh, acquires tea right? It controls the tea trade from uh, India and China to England. And in the North American colonies, those colonists like tea as well. So um, the parliament comes up with what they think is a perfect plan. They say the way tea is delivered to the colonies right now, at the time, is that tea goes to merchants in London who sell it to uh, other merchants who bring it across the North Atlantic to the American colonies where it's sold to further merchants and then sold to the public. And so there's a lot of middlemen in between and each middleman puts a little bit of profit on top of it. So the British say, um, you know, East India Company's in trouble. We need to get them more sales, right? So that it benefits them directly. And then they say, and we want to establish the precedent of having the colonists accept taxation for revenue generation. And they said, and here's the perfect plan. We're gonna put a tax on this tea that's being delivered from the East India Company. By, it's a very small tax, but it's explicitly a tax put on the tea to generate revenue for parliament. And here's why they think it's the kicker. Even with this small tax put on it, the tea the East India Company is going to be selling is going to be much cheaper than the tea they've been buying because they're cutting out all the middlemen. The East India Company is going to bring it directly from Asia to the market, cutting out all those middlemen who put on their own little profit. So they see it as perfect win-win. We're going to help the East India Company, which is going to keep that representative British interests uh, um, solvent right? And also keep our shares solvent, right? Uh, because they're the folks making the rules. They're going to sell tea to the colonists. It'll be cheaper. So the colonists will be happy. They're getting uh, tea uh, at a cheaper price than what they paid before. And we will establish the precedence of putting a little revenue generating tax on top of it. Not enough to make it more expensive. In fact, it's significantly more cheaper. But then 
once they get used to the idea of paying these taxes to generate money for parliament, uh, then it'll make life easier going forward, right? They think that's the perfect plan. We know what happens. Uh, the colonists are dismayed by that. All right, so that's the setup for the film. I also have a, a very short uh, reading that I've linked up uh, on Blackboard uh, on sugar and stamps. It gives sort of the uh, background uh, on this. It's a very short article. Uh, it'll help you understand uh, a little uh, in a little bit more detail what you're going to see in the film. Uh, and so the film's linked up there as well. So the schedule going forward, uh, Wednesday we will have the review session. So bring your questions about the 10 questions you have and we'll go through them in some measure of detail. Uh, and then the final exam is on the 12th, so a week from Wednesday. All right, so I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Bye. I have a quick question. Ask. I know I'm overlooking it, but where do I turn my paper in? Uh, on uh, Blackboard, uh, there's a link to the 